this special segment from Investment Masterminds with Shana orsic Sissel. She's the founder of Bonnery and Capital. And uh, Shana, you're kind of like a, a phoenix rising from the ashes. You know, I think you're one of the most courageous and resilient entrepreneurs that I've met on Wall Street. And, and you've really earned the nickname, the queen of alts. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I'm seeing you on, on Fox Business. I'm seeing you on Bloomberg. You've been a contributor to CNBC. So I really appreciate you coming on Investment Masterminds to speak with us today. Uh, for our audience out there, if you didn't know already, Bonnery and Capital is the leader in outsourced CIO uh, for financial firms. And, and Shana and her team really helps to evaluate and include alternative investments in portfolio design. So I was actually watching, uh, I, I picked it up on LinkedIn last week, but I saw Shana talking, I think it was on maybe Fox or someplace else, talking about uh, the economy and some of the headwinds out there. And this recent trend that I've been seeing in smaller headlines is this increase, especially recently in the last year or two, in credit card debt in, in the addition of, of uh, high rates that, that are out there. So, you know, I kind of want to ask Shana to start, you know, what, what are your concerns right now? And what are the obstacles you're seeing that, that could disrupt the economy? So my concern right now is um, that it's going to take longer for a recession to kind of come to fruition because there's a lot of excess liquidity in the system. Uh, I was watching CNBC this morning and Cameron Dawson is brilliant and I was kind of listening to what she was saying and, and she pointed out something um, that I don't know if a lot of people are aware of, but going into this debt ceiling uh, discussion um, and, and trying to come up with a, a deal, the Treasury has stopped issuing new bonds. What they're doing is they're spending cash. And by doing that, they're putting more liquidity into the system. Mm -hmm. Now, add that to the fact that the, tre uh, the, the Fed put more liquidity into the system following the failure of SVB and Signature Bank. And there is actually, despite the fact that rates are increasing, there has been an increase in liquidity in the system, which in order for a recession to occur, you really need to see that pulled out. So getting to a deal as it results, uh, as it pertains to the debt ceiling is super important uh, because that will allow the treasury to start issuing bonds again, uh, which will start to pull some of that liquidity in, out of the system. But what that means for us is that Everybody has kind of thought that the recession was going to happen in the fourth quarter of this year. And I'm beginning to feel like it might be more like the first or second quarter of next year. But there is stress in the system, as you pointed out, like the lower end consumer. Uh, we're seeing an increase in credit card applications. We're seeing an increase in the use of credit cards and credit card debt. We're seeing some defaults in the auto loan space. So these are some things to kind of keep your eye on and watch because you're starting to see some stress on the lower income consumer. And if that starts to move up the system, that would be concerning. But there is still almost a trillion dollars in excess savings. Unfortunately, it's really at the higher end of the income earners. So there's a big divergence between the haves and the have nots right now. And that is concerning uh, to me. Um, but again, I, I do think my bigger concern is that it's going to take longer for a recession to happen. And the longer it takes, the worse it will probably be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. A uh, big fan of Cameron Dawson. She's been on the show before as well. So love to hear that you're listening to her. Um, and, and yeah, I do feel that that uh, I agree. It seems like the Fed has been fighting the Treasury uh, where the, the Fed is trying to uh, you know reduce the liquidity and bring down uh, inflation, whereas the Treasury and the administration and, and not nothing political about it is that they're injecting more money into the economy one way or another. And now you're saying that the Fed, because of the events with SVP, is actually fighting it itself, essentially. <laughs> I, I mean, some of that has come back out, but there's still more in there from that injection. Um, you know, it, it's just really interesting to me. The market is kind of pricing in a, a rate cut in the fourth quarter. And I just don't see how that's possible. You know, the economy would have to completely tank um, and, and everything would have to fall apart from here. And it's not that that couldn't happen. I mean, there's always the chance that some unforeseen geopolitical event or, you know, natural disaster could very well cause something like that. And that's unforeseen. But barring something like that, I, I just don't see the economy falling completely falling apart by the fourth quarter. And quite frankly, if inflation remains sticky, the Fed can't cut rates. Now, what they can do is, you know, use their balance sheet to ease conditions. But that headline rate is going to remain high. And, and quite frankly, I think more likely than not go higher. Yeah. And you mentioned the difference between the, the lower end consumer and the, the higher end consumer. And really, that is two different plays when you talk about credit card debt, right? If you talk about the median versus the mean, that's two different equations. And as, as the median consumer has probably helped this this uh, economy uh, been stable stabilized over the last few years if they run out of spending power what what will that mean 
the economy, we, we don't know as well. So that's another area that people kind of don't think about when they when they get in the room and say, hey, well, the mean is looking fine. Debt to equity ratios are fine because home values are so high. But if you look at the consumer that doesn't own a home and now their equity ratio is underwater, you know, that that could be something that would uh, work against us as well. Keep in mind, the home values are high because no one wants to sell because no mm-hmm. one wants to sell their 2% mortgage. So uh, the only um, home sales that are occurring are either new builds, and most builders are not just building, they're only building on demand when they have a buyer. Uh, and as far as existing homes, the only people who are selling their existing homes are people that have to, usually because of a relocation uh, or some other stress, um, but not because they necessarily want to. The average person is not uh, downsizing right now, because even if you wanted to downsize, you're probably not going to save any money, uh, or they are uh, not looking to upside because they can't afford as much as they once did. So the, the home price price situation is really a result of just supply demand issues. There's a lot of demand and not a lot of supply. And uh, I can use myself as an example. You know, we, we want more room, but we're not going to sell because we have that right. So we're going to build up the attic, which is going to be a major inconvenience and probably cost more than it would to just sell a home and buy a new one. But we're not going to lose that low rate and go for a higher rate going forward. So, yeah, there, I mean, there's certainly a lot of headwinds out there. Uh, that we can see in the economy. It's a good point that if we don't see that recession come to fruition in the fourth quarter of this year, and you know, there's nothing to say that there has to be one, but uh, you know, our team at least at, at Swan is, is in line with you thinking that we do need some type of recession to to, to see the inflation come down. And uh, if it is later and going into next year, that could be a real, a bigger issue that we have to unfold at that time. And next year is an election year yes. where you'll have uh, in any administration at that time will be throwing everything they can to promote liquidity in the process uh, which who knows where that could end up if that comes to, to, to fruition. And not only that, but I like to remind people that recessions are completely healthy and normal. Not having a recession is unhealthy and not normal. Uh, the longer you stave off a session, the, the more likely it is to be worse. Uh, you know, inflate the entire purpose of the business cycle, right, is, you know, expansion, contraction, and it's to keep excess out of the system, right? Um, when excess gets too much, the recession kind of blows that out of the system. The longer it takes for a recession to happen, because you're artificially trying to avoid one, the more excess stays in the system, which leads to bigger problems down the road. I really think that people should be less afraid of the idea of a recession. You know, unemployment at 3.4%, that's extremely low, even by historical historical levels. Not that I'm encouraging the idea of people should lose their jobs, but there is what's called structural, what it should be structurally for a healthy economy. And just like it's unhealthy to have things be really out of whack in a negative way, it's unhealthy for the economy to have things really out of whack in a positive way. You know, inflation at 2%, that is not normal. It's more like three and a half to four. Unemployment at 3.4%, you got a lot of uh, tightness in the employment system, uh, which causes additional problems. Uh, there's, There's all sorts of things to consider. So I just really think that people are freaking out about the potential for a recession. I think we should really be hoping that one happens sooner rather than later, because if it happens sooner rather than later, it probably will be a very shallow recession. And that is exactly what we want. Absolutely. So now that we've kind of covered some of those those headwinds out there, I did want to ask you about a little bit about Bonri and what you're doing. I, I saw that you hired a, a couple of, of new excellent uh, employees and uh, or partners, I should say. And I want to know what's going on with the firm and, and how really can you help advisors out there? So we're doing some really exciting things at Bonrian. Um, You know, we have our tech solution, our front end tech solution built, but we're working on some exciting things for a potential back end solution in terms of operational compliance reporting uh, that I'm very excited about. So we haven't really pushed or gone to market with REAs just yet because we want to be able to provide you with that end to end solution that is really what, you know, the holy grail is in our business. Uh, And we're still working on it. And so for that reason, you probably haven't seen us a ton, but advisors who are interested in sort of starting to allocate to alternatives and wanting help and being able to a build those portfolios in a smart way that they can scale and maintain those positions over a full market cycle and also who are looking for ways to add value to their clients with interesting and exciting private offerings that's what we're really focusing on right now is building out that part of our platform so i i like to say this um it's kind of a little bit of a joke but um on our private platform side we like to help advisors come up with good stories and things that they can be really excited to talk to clients about because we understand that most advisors have not really dived into the private market, illiquid capital call lockup kind of situation. Um, And it's a little scary to broach those conversations with clients. And let's be honest, the really traditional institutional level private equity or private credit isn't that exciting. Uh, It's not something you get excited to call 
your clients about and with the headlines of B read and things of that nature, I think people are genuinely concerned about anything that says illiquid. Uh, so we're looking for interesting ways that fall into two buckets. We like to say that's ego and impact. So finding ideas and solutions that get your clients excited where they can really um, emotionally connect with a, a, a type of investment. So things like sports rights, um, wine funds, uh, things of that nature. And then impact being ways to like make the world a better place. It's a little cliche, but microfinance funds that support female entrepreneurs, Opportunity Zone, which is rehabbing low-income housing with co-investment from municipalities, low-density um, vintage types of rehab, to kind of improve your community and quote unquote, make the world a better place. I think clients really relate to that. And sometimes I, I believe as an industry, we lose track of the fact that, you know, the individual, what gets them excited to invest is very different from what makes an endowment or, you know, mm -hmm. an institution or a pension fund excited to invest. And as advisors, the goal isn't to beat the market by 10, 20%. I think we, as a, you know, as professionals put that in people's head, clients just want to know that they'll be able to reach their financial goals. They won't run out of money, that they'll be able to maintain their life, lifestyle if they're retired, that they'll be able to pay for their kids' college or buy that house. It doesn't really matter if you got them a, a little extra. Uh, what does matter is if you lose them and then you can't uh, meet those goals. So the focus here is not on finding those, you know, unicorn opportunities that are going to be hundred X. Uh, it's, it's finding those opportunities where there's inefficient markets, where your client can get excited about what they're investing in. And it also makes the conversation a little easier because it becomes less focused on that illiquidity and that lockup component. If you have an investment that you're excited to invest in, you're not really going to be uh, pushing to sell it uh, anytime in the near future. So that's kind of our focus on the private side. And then on the 40 act side, being able to provide, you know, diversified solutions that you can plug into your client portfolios like you would any other model uh, that you would see or any other fund to fund option that you would see. So just make it easier to scale. And that, that's kind of how we're helping advisors. And then on the asset manager side, we're really looking to find partners that are committed to the advisor market that want to service and support advisors uh, well. Uh, because we think that that is something that's actually missing. Uh, I think a lot of alternative asset managers, especially the very large ones, just see it as a, a play to gather assets and get some tickets, but they don't really have the desire uh, to support and service the advisor as a true partner. So we want to build a platform where advisors can come, know that we've done our due diligence for you so you can feel confident in the, the quality and stability of the managers we have, but also feel confident in the fact that the managers that are on our platform want to work with you, want to be a partner, and will take your phone call when you have questions. Yeah. And I just want to kind of add to that. I feel like it's part of the evolution of not only investments, but of the human element. Right. So I think investing 20 years ago, especially in the 80s, was about money and greed, where now is the, the evolved investor, especially on the high net worth side. Um, but even down to, to anybody that has money to invest wants some type of social responsibility or I don't know if that's the word for it, but but some meaning, I guess, some meaning within their portfolios yeah. and alternatives, whether they be 40 act. Uh, or or other can help to to provide some of that in some some way shape or form. So not only really that, but it. people uh, alternatives is really the only space where you can create that connection. You know, you're not going to create it in the traditional space. Uh, so you know that's really the focus here. I, I just think that it's really important. Um, you know, ego stuff doesn't really fall into that social governance kind of thing. But uh, again, it's about just connecting and getting excited about investing, which is half a battle, quite frankly. Absolutely. Well, Shannon or Cecil, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on. It's an honor to have you on Investment Masterminds, and we look forward to having you again on again soon. Thanks for having me. Welcome, everyone, to this special segment from Investment Masterminds with Shannon.